motivational content on the platform. I'm super excited to announce a new experience on Creative Live. It's called Fast Class. You've told us that you're busy and sometimes it's hard to dive into a full class from start to finish. So essentially we're now giving you a shortened highlight version of our top Creative Live classes. You can always dive into the full class with five, 10 or 15 hours of great content. But now if you're just looking to focus on a few of the highlights or wanna be able to skip quickly to something that really interests you, you can now get a shortened fast class version of that class. We're also thinking this might be able to help you explore a new craft and save time while doing it. This is a great tool to curate your learning experience to help create the life that you seek. So you're probably thinking, great, how do I access this new experience on Creative Live? That's easy. All you have to do is be a subscriber to the Creator Pass and then all this is yours. If you're feeling isolated and looking for creative connection, try tuning into creativelive.com slash TV. That's where we've got a 24 seven live stream from the kitchen counters. I can do that back lit shot that I really like to do. From the studios and living rooms of many of the world's top creators where we're doing musical performances, Q and A's, cooking shows, virtual book tour events, drawing, spoken word poetry, and more. Life passed me by waiting for an invitation when the world is greater than my nation or my occupation. Be someone you've never been. You feel all that adrenaline, it's medicine. It actually helps me feel like my days are more purposeful. I hope that out of this deep pain will come some collective growth. Dive into Creative Live TV today. Hello, everyone. Good morning or good afternoon or good evening, wherever you're uh, watching from. I'm seeing we got people from South Africa, from Dubai, from Australia, all over the world. So range of time zones. I want to say welcome. 
I'm Chase Jarvis, the founder of Creative Live and your host for today's live broadcast as a part of the Chase Jarvis Live Show. My guest is very, very special. Before we get into his details and our conversation today, I want to invite you to check out creativelive.com slash TV, where uh, we've got live chat coming in from all over the world. If you'd want to leave a comment or uh, shout out a question for our guest, I am seeing those questions and I will do what I can to forward them on. Um, you might be watching this on Facebook or on YouTube Live. If that's the case, I can't see your comments, but the best uh, interactive opportunity is at creativelive.com slash TV. Click the live chat in the upper right-hand corner, and I'll see your questions and comments. Um, and I know you're going to want to have a question and or a comment for this gentleman because he is a New York Times bestselling author, speaker, and a freelance photographer. He's done cover stories for Nat Geo, Life Magazine, Fortune, Newsweek, and many others and was on the Chicago Tribune staff that won the Pulitzer back in 2001. He's also the Professor Emeritus of Visual Communications at Ohio University, and most notably, the official photographer of President Reagan, and then the chief official White House photographer and director of the White House Photo Office for President Barack Obama. My guest is the one and only inimitable Mr. Pete Souza in the house. Pete, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Chase. I appreciate it. Oh, it's a treat. Um, I know we've been working on this for some time, but you're a busy guy. Congratulations on um, a couple of books you've put out recently. You've been touring prior to the pandemic, obviously. But for those of, of uh, the handful of people, of the thousands tuning in from all over the world, who might not be familiar with your career arc, how you um, tackled all those accolades and were the, um, the White House photographer for both Reagan and Obama, I was wondering... If you could trace a little bit of your career arc, how you got excited, interested about photography, and what um, what twists and turns your career took on your way to the White House. I've had a lot of twists and turns in my, in my career. I actually went to uh, Boston University with the hopes of becoming a sports writer um, and was in their, their journalism school. And in my junior year, I took a photography class uh, this is back in the day, of course, of black and white film and making your own prints. And I think that, uh, in all honesty, the first print I ever made where you were inside the dark room under those red safe lights and that image magically appeared in the tray of Dectal developer that I was hooked on photography because to me it was it was magic. Um, so that's sort of like how it how, how it started for me fairly late in life because I know a lot of people uh, uh, make pictures in high school and things like that. I didn't, you know, it was my junior year of college, and it took me probably to the point of maybe I guess like I want to say five years before I got any good at it. Um, I think I was a slow slow learner in a lot of ways. And um, and I and then I started out working for small newspapers in Kansas, and really for me it's been a matter of I think um, a good worth work ethic and a lot of luck along the way. Uh, in in all honesty, that uh, sort of propelled me to uh, where I ended up. It's a, it, it's just hard work and and uh, and luck. I mean. Uh, you know, just decisions that you make, you get to the this point of your life uh, and you start thinking back uh, on decisions that you made back in the day. And, and, you know, and it just one thing led to another. And I ended up uh, becoming, you know, a presidential photographer twice. Never, you know, it was something I ever aspired to. It just kind of that's the direction I. <laughs> <laughs> I, I ended up in, basically. Well, was it your photojournalism background that you feel like prepared you best for that? Was it, uh, is it some sort of a tenacity to chase the story? Is it your ability to see? I mean, there's, you know, millions of photographers around the world and tens of thousands in D.C. and probably thousands that would be in contention for some of the jobs that you've received. What do you feel like is the difference maker? You mentioned luck and, and a little bit of uh, a, a little bit of skill. I think you probably need to flip the order there, but it, is there um, is there any one decision that you feel like really 
change the trajectory of your career or was it tenacity? What, what, what put you in the hunt at all? I mean, I think it was being at a journalism school when I, um, discovered photography, you know, cause maybe had I been in an art school or, um, uh, places I could have been. I happened to be in the journalism school and thus became a, a, a you know, a photojournalist as, as a result. And I think for me, the initial attraction was photography, not necessarily photojournalism. Um, I think I have this, uh, I always tell people that I don't think I'm the greatest photographer in the world, but I really believe I was the, the right photographer to be the chief official White House photographer for President Obama. I just think everything in my career came together in that job. Um, the ability uh, uh, and, and the, I, I think I had developed an eye for framing and the moment, the anticipation, um, but also the ability to really hang out and not uh, be a nuisance and not interfere with what was taking place, you know, essentially be a fly on the wall um, and, and, and do that in a professional way uh, and, and have as my main subject, someone who understood the role of having somebody like me visually record a presidency, um, just like everything came together in, in, that, in that job, in the, the eight years of that job, which to me is sort of like the, you know, the capstone of my career. Yeah, clearly pen, penultimate. Um... But I mean, also like, I mean, just having had the experience at National Geographic for a few years where I learned more about light and color than I probably did when I was working for a newspaper. And so, you know, the, just, it's, I mean, all these factors came into play. Um, well, one of the things that I loved that you said, which I think is often really wildly overlooked, um, coming from a photographic background myself, is the ability, the technical skills I think that is just one small piece of an otherwise complex puzzle. And what I loved, you said it very clearly, your ability to hang out, to be in a position to get the shot, not, I think you said nuisance, not be a nuisance. And and I just think that that is the most sort of underappreciated, under or misunderstood part about, um, about any photographic job. And so what people are thinking right now, the photographers in the, uh, in the audience, again, we've just had some more folks join from Indonesia, from Hungary, from Mexico. What I think they want to hear is, well, great. How do you get good at hanging out? <laughs> if the technical skills you can master, um, what is it, what does it mean? How do you practice that? And is it a social skill? Is it, are you an extroverted introverted build a little, a uh, little story for us around, you know, why you think you might be great at that. Um, you, you know, I wish I could uh, give you a bullet point list of, you know, here's how it's done. Um, I just had a, a long conversation on the phone the other day with somebody who was applying to be an official photographer for one of our governors. And, you know, and, and he was asking the same question. And I was like, you know, every case is different. And, and, it's, and it's something that I think you develop as a human human being, more so than as a photographer, is sort of how to how to relate to people, and every person is different. Um, and and this is why I say I think I was the, the the you know the right person to be Barack Obama's photographer. I mean, we're sort of from the same more or less uh, generation. I'm actually a few years older than him, and I think that actually helped, you know. But but also knowing just like understanding when um, to, to say something to them and when not to say something to them. And, it, and it's not something that you can teach. It's just, uh, it, it's something that you uh, sort of learn over time, I think. And, that, and that's about the best 
answer that I can give. I think it's really hard to articulate other than it's different for, uh, you know, every situation. I mean, I think Bill Clinton would have been, you know, a completely different character in terms of how you would relate to him because he's such, you know, much more gregarious uh, personality than President Obama. And I don't mean that in a negative or other way. I'm just saying they're, they're two different people. And so it's, it's just hard to give an answer to that. No, I, I think that's, I think embedded in that answer that it's hard is it's hard to put a finger on is that's part of the je ne sais quoi that I, I think those who are trying to emulate your career, any career, I think ought to know. And it's something that not a lot of creators uh, talk about or can define. Um, you mentioned President Clinton, President Obama, but so far we haven't talked much about your experience photographing Reagan. Do you feel like that was that like a a uh, a prep lap? Was it was that like your your warm up um, presentation for uh, for what was ultimately the um, the penultimate with with Obama? Talk talk to us a little bit about the differences between not just the the characters but your role in those two different presidencies. I think looking back on it now, it was a it was a prep for Obama. Uh, I didn't think that at the time, because at the time, I was thinking, this is the one and only time I'm ever going to be inside the White House as an official photographer, so I'm going to try to make the most of it. I was not the chief photographer. I was hired by his chief photographer, Michael Evans, in the middle of his first term. So I came in, I was like the new guy. And, you know, it took a, a little sort of getting used to. Um, I, I, was, I was in my tw late 20s, and I was overwhelmed with suddenly being able to just walk into the Oval Office. Um, and so, I th and, and I think the access situation was a little different in that I didn't have, you know, total access. Um, but I still feel that I was able to make some really good moments during the Reagan administration. It's just they weren't as many because of the particular situation with Reagan. He, I mean, I tell people this. Um, I didn't necessarily agree with his politics, um, but I did think he was a decent human being and that he respected the office of uh, the presidency. And I think that it would be difficult to do that job for me if I did not have uh, both of those. In other words, that I didn't think the, the president was a decent human being and that they were respecting the office. I think it would be difficult to me, for me to work under any other circumstance. Um, I, I liked President Reagan. He was difficult to get to know. Um, even even his family says that. Um, uh, but I mean, he was a, a g genial, old-fashioned, um, uh, conservative. I don't mean in his politics. I mean in his manners, his mannerism. Uh, you know, very. He didn't take his suit coat off in the Oval Office unless it was the weekend. Uh, so, so it was like, and you know, and it was the eighties, so it was a different, a different era. Well, if that was the, um, the preparation workout, if you will, um, for what would ultimately be your, uh, eight year tour duty with, with Obama, is there anything that you learned? Can, is there any like burning memory that you have that said, if I, if given another opportunity, what I would do differently, or there are some key mistakes, key, key learning moments that came out of that first tour of duty with Reagan that you applied to your, your second with Obama? The, you know, one of the things that happened was that the, you know, this was back in the eighties when there wasn't social media where you were shooting film and it would take, you know, a day before you would see what you had shot, that kind of thing. And most of the uh, pictures that the White House then released were, were there, there were very few. 
and it wasn't the like the behind the scenes moments necessarily. Um, I say that because um, I went into the Obama administration with, uh, I guess, uh, a, a few thoughts. One was that I needed to have total access and that I was going to be starting on day one. That was all that uh, was my focus. And President Obama understood that, but imagine uh, he's, a, he's a human being like you and I, and to all of a sudden have this guy taking pictures of you every day, all day long, you know, it takes a little getting used to. So it was sort of like trying to, you know, navigate that in a way that um, I wasn't going to relinquish my access. So, and, and that was something that I didn't have during the Reagan administration, which was total access. I was determined that I was going to have that in the Obama administration. So that's one. Two was going back to those behind the scenes moments. That was my focus too, is capturing the spontaneous moments as they happen. And whether they're seen right away or like with Reagan, they're not seen till 10 years later, 20 years later, it didn't matter. What mattered is making sure that I was gonna make those pictures in the first place. And I guess lastly, it was, um, was uh, to make authentic pictures uh, of, of what was taking place in his presidency. Well, uh, part of, uh, I'm getting questions in from all over the world, and one of them is from Anders, uh, obviously reveres your work. Um, i thankful for our conversation today, but wants me to ask, and it's along the same lines as what you were just speaking of, which is while I'm bringing it up, about the, um, the juxtaposition between prepared images and reportage or candid moments. Is that something you negotiate? Um, how do you balance those two? What was the approach? Uh, the approach was uh, <laughs> everything was spontaneous. And um, again, it was the, um, uh, you know, my pushing to always be there. Um, there. I mean, we did photo lines per se, you know, where, you know, that person comes in, they want to get a picture standing in front of the desk with the president, you make that picture. Uh, and that's obviously you know, a posed picture, but everything else is as it happens. And it was, um, that was something that um, uh, President Obama inherently, was that the right word? Uh, understood. And it wasn't, it didn't need to be negotiated. Um, and this, you know, imagine if he's not objecting to me being in the room, how could anybody else? And so it was just expected that I would I would always be there. And 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 you know, I sort of talked about this in terms of how I made this work. I made sure that I knew my role was as an observer. My role was not as a participant. So I'm in these meetings or I'm in these situations and, um, you know, I don't uh, interrupt. I don't like say what I think. Um, I keep, you know, keep my mouth shut. Now that doesn't mean that if I'm alone with him um, that, that, that I might, you know, converse with him, but I always made it a point that when I, when he was in the middle of a conversation with somebody, I was not, part of that conversation. I was the observer, unless, you know, somebody would say something to me. Well, the, I think this is a key area, just seeing, again, more questions come in. Um, a key area of curiosity, does that mean you never coached? Like, hey, Barack, you know, turn your head a little more sideways or, you know, step forward into the light. Is, is there any coaching that happens in those worlds, even when you're just, uh, it's just you and he? Uh, no, no coaching at all. Interesting. Really, really fascinating. 
Well, let's um, depart for a second on the, uh, the psychology of what it was like and your philosophy on photographing and touch just briefly on something that I'm not that enamored with, but I know <laughs> from the comments people are interested in the technology. Obviously, you mentioned huge arc in technology change from your first assignment as a photojournalist back at the at the papers then obviously um, probably a different world where you had a lot of film being pushed through the system. But as you mentioned, it was film and a lot of these images were delayed. And then the instantaneous, you're looking at the back of a camera and you probably are wi fiing it to someone else. Can you talk about maybe those three different buckets and what it was like to be um, both, uh, I guess, anchored by in some ways and uh, empowered by the different modes of operating, you know, between your early career and later, later on with Obama and the instant nature of digital photography? Um, I, I, I switched to digital in 2000 um, when I was with the Chicago Tribune. And I, I remember it was then because it was the uh, on the way to the New Hampshire primary on the plane with my new digital cameras that I was sort of reading the manual trying to figure out how to use this camera. Was that a D1, a Nikon D1 what by chance? D1, yeah. Yeah, I remember that camera. And, um, you know, up until then, I had still been shooting film um, for the Tribune, color, color negative film at the time. Uh, and so that began the transition uh, for me. And, um, it, you know, one of, the, one of the great regrets is that those early digital cameras were were not that good yeah. and uh, you know subsequently the following year i, I uh, after 9 11 i went to afghanistan for the beginning of the of the war and you know risked my life and um it, the, there i made images that i'm as proud of as any i've ever made in my career and those are on you know like the the old digital camera and that really hurts me to this two, day. Two, a two megabyte file, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was like, you know, whatever megabyte file, and because of hard drive space when you're in Afghanistan, that, you know, I, I, was, I had to shoot JPEG and not RAW. So that really pains me looking back on it. Um, the, you know, subsequently over the years, the digital uh, cameras got better and better and better and better. And my predecessor, uh, Eric Draper, who is George W. Bush's chief White House photographer, uh, made the switch to digital at the start of Bush's second term. Um, and that he transitioned the White House photo office to an all digital uh, office. And so when I started, uh, er Eric was really great about you know transitioning the, uh, with me. And um, the, the, I, I'm so glad that he was the one that did that and that didn't fall on my shoulders uh, because that made it easier to hit the ground running uh, with the, 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 you know, just digital workflow with, with, uh, with the White House. Um, so, um, and, and, and matter of fact, I was um, talking to somebody about this the other day. I realized that you know, I started photographing Barack Obama after he had been elected to the U.S. Senate in 2004, and it's I've come to the realization that I have never, ever made a single image of Barack Obama on a with film. Every picture I've ever made of him, starting in 2004, uh, has been on. Uh, a digital camera, which is kind of crazy to me. Um, yeah, so I mean, one of the one of the things that I try to still, even though uh, given the immediacy of digital during the Obama administration, I still made it clear to everyone that my main job was to document the presidency for history. That's the main part of the job is that, uh, so I did not want to be carrying a laptop with me 
or worrying about sending pictures wirelessly in the moment uh, because, you know, the White House website wanted something right away. So I set the marker down right away that I would not operate like that, that I did not want to be in the middle of some big speech sending a photo back you know, so the White House would have it right away to post on Twitter or what, whatever. That was not, you know, the main function of my job. So, um, you know, that rubbed shoulder, rub, rub people some a little bit the wrong way, and I would try to accommodate, you know, them as much as I could. But I wasn't going to be carrying a laptop, and I wasn't going to not be uh, documenting what he was doing just so somebody could have a picture right away. Um, so, um, that was, that was a big, uh, a big distinction that I made, uh, and I held firm on that. Is that a negotiation? I mean, what? It, no, it wasn't a negotiation. You... It was like, this is the way I'm doing it. Because to me, it, the, uh, you know, posting stuff on social media is, is, is not, Number one on the job description. Number one is documenting the presidency for history. All my pictures, every single one of them, ends up at the National Archives. I didn't want to miss something because I was sending something back. Yeah, so doing that, something that was number four, five, or ten on the list, right? right. Yeah. So, well, if if it's um, if it's not a negotiation, is this then something you have worked out in the job interview, so to speak? I think people are wondering how you actually get this job. You mentioned, um, you know, working uh, for the senator after his election to the Senate for Illinois. Um, so is this a is this a part of the relationship building over time where you establish your boundaries? Um, and I'm thinking, you know, if this is your your client, for example, that this is broadly applicable for anyone who's listening. I'm just curious what your methodology was for sort of stamping. I think you said you put your marker down. You know, how does one do that and and not make enemies, or did you have to make some enemies and stand tall with something you believe deeply in? Oh, I'm sure some people were pissed off at me, <laughs> but you know, it it's part still, of the job, right? I, part of the I, job. Yeah, I mean, I I. I said to them, I will help you out if it doesn't interfere with uh, documenting for history and um, interrupting, um, you know, a big event, uh, documenting a big event so that, um, you know, I could get you your picture so you could tweet it out while it was happening is not a good argument to make. So, I mean... The, um, you know, I did have a staff. So if, if, the, if, if said event was at the White House, it would be real easy after the event to hand a photo editor my cards and they could start the process. So it wasn't like it was going to be the next day, but it wasn't going to be, you know, in the moment. And, um, you know, and there, and there were instances where, uh, State of the Union, for example, I would have um, one of the photographers that worked for me uh, set up like where the press is, and he may live transmit something from his camera. You know, so we were trying to we would try to make accommodations, but to to you know, I did not want to. Um, uh, sort of go overboard about, you know, social media being the number one thing on my, you know, list of things to do. Uh, I think it's just ruthless prioritization. And I, that's part of what a lot of people need to hear. I think that, that the modern creator uh, is a person who wears lots of hats. And I think it's really curious and interesting as someone who is, you know, the chief photographer of the White House who has a staff um, still has to wear hat, many hats and still has to make hard decisions of what to do and what not to do. I think that's well, I mean, telling. I think that it, 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 it's, it's an unusual job in that it's 
the I mean it's it's the only staff photography job um, where you're also the boss. In other words, the, the the photo editors work for you. They don't. It's not like most newspapers and magazines. You know, the photo editor is the boss, right? And so, um, that you know that that easier to sort of say, okay, this is the way it's going to be. Um, and but but again, it wasn't. It, you know, the num as I said, the number one thing in the back of my mind was documenting for history and every argument to me was based on that. Uh, you mentioned the photo editor and that brings to mind conjures up sort of workflow and, and questions about editing. And, um, if you had an editor, those, those editor editors, those editors work for you. What was the relationship with that, with, with, with them? And, we got Kristen Schmidt asking, you know, how do you catalog these photos? What kind of a, you know, you, you've remarked several times about you're in this for history. Um, that's a very profound burden to bear. And, you know, obviously every day when you're posting pictures uh, of, of shade, you're able to keep clearly able to keyword search for a moment that's happened in the previous day. And so I, I think, you know, as you have, done such a nice job of pulling back the curtain for us maybe you could share a little bit about about the editing process and you know what goes into creating a catalog like you have that's at your fingertips but also infinitely complex and sliceable and diceable you know an infinity number of ways yeah so we had you know we had a filing uh, a, a filing system like we, we established the file name for each photograph which was based on uh, the, the date and then, you know, the file number chronologically throughout the day. So we have this file number, you know, uh, dash starting 0001 and then, you know, chronological throughout the day. Uh, every single photograph had a caption attached. Um, we had a photo, photo archivist that had been there since the Reagan administration. I had actually known her back in the Reagan days. And, um, and so she would then go in and try to add um, everybody's name that was pictured, uh, keywords. Um, so, I mean, I'm as proud of the uh, images as I am of the information that's attached to each image. For historians, it's just like so important to have that information. So, for instance, you could, if you wanted to, you know, uh, search at the National Archives, you know, Obama alone with Dennis McDonough, all the pictures from the eight years would come up. You know, that's the kind of system we, we, we built. And we, we wanted to make sure that all that information, I mean, one of the things that Eric Draper had said to me, this is Bush's photographer, was that a lot of the information was lost when, during the transfer from the White House to the National Archives. Mm. And so we made, the, the, the one upgrade we did is we, we made, the, we worked with the National Archives and they built a database that included uh, all, the, you know, the ability to transfer all the information that was attached with each image. In terms of editing, it would be something like uh, on a daily basis, the White House website would come to us and say, hey, we, we would like to use, a, we're doing a post of the president's meeting with Angela Merkel, and we need, we need a picture to go with that post. So the, one of the photo editors would go through um, my take and, and select two or three images and usually email them to me. I actually ran my office basically on my BlackBerry. So they would email me the images and I would say, yes, yeah, send all three, or I don't, you know, I, I only like the second one, or I might say, eh, I thought I shot this particular image. Can you see if you can find that? And that's, so that's how the editing process worked. In terms of, we started doing this uh, monthly upload on Flickr. At the end of the month, we would do a series of behind the scenes pictures. And that's something that would, 
um, in, involve uh, more editing, more of my involvement, more where I would show the pictures to uh, somebody in the White House press office to make sure that, you know, they're okay with, with them. So that's sort of how it worked. Yeah. Uh, brilliant. And just to dedicate, as someone who knows, has cataloged millions and millions of my own images and knows uh, just enough to be dangerous about the the uh, amount of work that goes in. It's not a surprise that you say you're as proud as the uh, cataloging and the image or the uh, information as you are the image. Um, but I do. I, I think that's just phenomenal as a contribution to history because the image without as much of that that information is is less of a historical record. Um, what about the technology? You mentioned databases and what kind of platform were you using? Are you using the same ones today? Um, is the National Archive built on something that is consumer grade? Is it enterprise grade? What's, you know, talk to us a little bit about um, some of the technology used in your workflow, and then we'll move on to less tactical and more, uh, <laughs> more yeah. um, strategic and contemplative things. Yeah, so, I mean, we <clears throat> in, ingested our uh, cards using Photo Mechanic, mm -hmm. um, which is sort of something that photojournalists tend to use. Um, easy to add uh, captions and keywords and things like that. And then uh, the database uh, was, was something that Eric Draper had purchased a license to Merlin One. And so all the images would go... Uh, into Merlin one and we you know we'd have a server and a backup server that the White House main, maintained. And then when it came time to transfer to the National Archives, they were not allowed to use Merlin one and for reasons that I'm not quite clear about, one of which was that once you send a record to the National Archives, you cannot change the record. And so Merlin one, you could go in and like, we would update captions all the time as we added names and things like that. But once it was sent to the, to the National Archives, it, it becomes a locked file from the White House to the National Archives. And Merlin, you can go in and change things. So they couldn't use Merlin. So, um, we, you know, I worked really diligently with them and, and an IT guy at the White House to build a similar system as mm -hmm. Merlin, and um, it it um, and so that's that's they they hired a contractor to build this database that is as good if not better than than Merlin. Wow. And, yeah. Well, Julie's asking, does do all of your photos end up in the National Archives then? Yeah, yeah every single one. Every. So a shot about one one point nine million. Photos. I didn't quite make it to two million. <laughs> <laughs> so they're all they're all now at the National Archives. Amazing, amazing! What a contribution to history. Um, I want to. Speaking of history, I want to shift gears to talk about some of the the key moments that you photographed that are, you know, indelibly engraved, embedded in um, in culture forever. Um, one that comes to mind is the image in the in the um, the moment where the raid on Osama bin Laden's compound is going down. Um, can you talk to us about you know your your experience there, what you can share, and um, just being in so many of those moments? Do you have some favorite photographs besides that one that is just so iconic? Yeah, so. Um, that was, that was a, a long day. That was a really long day. Um, but the, the, the raid itself, uh, when they were, when they were monitoring the raid as it happened, uh, that was like around about 40 minutes. Um, and it's as, uh, tense and anxious a time as, uh, as, as I can probably, uh, remember in my career, and and it was it was tense, uh, more so for the people in the room than it was for me. Although I was pretty tense too. Um, I mean, I think part of the, the 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 to me the the interesting aspect of the photograph is that you've got all the 
most powerful people in the executive branch of our government all jammed into this tiny room. Um, and yet in that moment, they are powerless because, you know, their, their decision had already been made and now it was up to those guys on the ground and they're watching this unfold and ain't, there's nothing they can do about it. Um, and I think that, you know, that, uh, the, the, the tension that you see in, in that photograph, it, and, I, and that was, a, that was a situation where, um, you know, I wish, I wish mirrorless cameras had, uh, had been in, um, had, had advanced to the point where they are now back then, this is 2011, they didn't. So I was using a Canon 5D Mark two, I guess, which was, you know, fairly quiet, but it did make noise. And so I did not, in those 40 minutes, I did not shoot a lot of frames. I think I shot a little over a hundred, as I recall, or maybe, maybe just under a hundred, which is not really a lot. And um, in terms of like choosing that particular image, um, I don't know, I think that that when when people are able to to see all the images that I shot in that room, uh, which they will eventually, um, I, I I think I, I think I chose the right one. I, I oh. feel confident that it's the best picture. Um, were there others where you could see the same tension? Yeah, but you know, oftentimes with that many people. In uh, in a picture, somebody's you know looking the other way, or you somebody's caught in the mid blank, or somebody's looking down, or or whatever. And for what, whatever reason, I mean that one just sort of gravitated right away. Um, and I think hopefully people will agree with agree with me when I look at all my images that I that I chose chose the right one. Oh, yeah, clearly stunning, stunning image. And that's part of why you shoot a hundred, right? Because of uh, the blinking and the nose picking and the scratching and the off moments, you got to shoot a hundred to get a handful of the ones that you love. Um, is that was that be did that become a tool for those moments? I think, and we're we're trying to speak specifically of some of these just hyper historic, like just amazing captures. Was the mirrorless? Did that become a um, a, a key piece of machinery for for that purpose of the silent or almost silent shutter? You know, we never used mirrorless cameras. I, the, to me, they hadn't yet gotten to the point where they were uh, could match the quality of the DSLR. I mean, I thought the Canon DSLR was fairly quiet. There was a silent mode. It wasn't totally silent, but it was pretty quiet. And I wasn't like a guy. I didn't use like a motor drive or rapid fire, or I didn't use a flash for, you know, the candid pictures. Um, and so I, I think... You know, I think people, th th it wasn't that uh, disruptive, if if at all. Yeah. Uh, you know, obviously today, it'd be much easier with a mirrorless to to to, to be the the fly on the wall because there's you know no noise if, yeah. if you so choose. Um, so, but the mirrorless didn't really come into play during during the Obama administration. I don't know about you, I still can't get over the the digital viewfinder concept you know the focus is always seems imprecise versus what i can see with my eye through an actual you know slr mirror um i suppose that technology is improved but um like i, I also I, I like you didn't really see it suitable for the pro jobs um i, I do you feel like in these moments um, you know, having the tool be just an extension of your body and you're focused on these moments. Did you trained for these moments in advance? Are you visualizing anything when you walk into this, this room, um, or you walk into the situation room or any of these other really high pressure, high profile moments that you've been so lucky to capture? Are you thinking about it, making a picture or, or is it always reacting in the moment? Oh, I, I'd say 90% of the time, just reacting in the moment. Um, and, um, you know, uh, uh, I think my, my framing and my, my use of light in, in certain instances have, have developed over time. Um, 
and and it's a it's a product of you know er everything I've experienced in my career. Um, there were the, you know there's a handful of times when um, one that comes to mind in particular is um, uh, you know le uh, on the last day leaving the Oval Office for the last time where you know I actually you know I was thinking about how can I uh, I I know what door he's walking out. I know about what time he's going to walk out and, you know, capture this in such a way that sort of embodies the, the, the moment. And so in a, in a case like that, I might think about it ahead of time and plan accordingly. In that particular case, it involved um, borrowing a ladder, uh, you know, to sort of get up high to show the, sort of the, the, as much of the Oval Office as, as, as I could. So, but those instances were pretty, pretty rare. Mm. Um, you mentioned early in your career, uh, or sorry, early in a conversation about um, being in Afghanistan and actually being in war. Can you juxtapose the moment of sitting in, say, the Situation Room when you were photographing the raid versus actually not at that moment, but being boots on the ground in a place like Afghanistan, which, you know, a lot of people in the in the uh, who are listening right now or watching have questions about the you know the juxtaposition of of the pressure of your job versus the the life and death aspects of, of being a, a war photographer yeah i mean i've had a couple of friends that have been killed in war and um there's no comparison uh y y yeah my job at the white house had a lot of pressure but there were no bullets flying over my head. There was no rocket propelled grenades heading my way, whistling through the air. Um, you know, my life wasn't in danger. And, and so it's a different kind of pressure, um, but doesn't compare to what it's like for, uh, you know, a war photographer. And which I will say I was not good at. I did not function well when I heard uh, you know, sniper bullets whistling over my head. I did not function well. And I was not made out to, um, to, <laughs> to, to, uh, to do that for, uh, for a career. I mean, I'm glad that I went to Afghanistan. There's, uh, there's pictures there I'm really proud of. Um, but it's, it's not something that I would ever do again. Yeah, it just seems so hardcore. Um, and obviously several in our community have passed over the course of the last two decades of conflict. Um, I want to shift gears and um, juxtapose all of this work that you've done um, in photojournalism for you know a couple of different administrations and, and the reportage with the uh, some work that I gather you do for fun. And I'm going to hearken a moment we've met before. I don't know if you remember this. I'm guessing you probably don't. Um, I was at the White House uh, hanging with um, the Lumineers at South by Southwest. I was a oh. guest of, yeah, I was a guest of, uh, of the administration and uh, I've known the Lumineers, helped them uh, start telling some stories early on in their career with, with oh. Jeremiah and uh, Wes. Those guys are amazing. We were standing in the Rose Garden um, talking about uh, taking pictures of music and whatnot. Um, so you take pictures of music. I you look familiar. I can... <laughs> now it's, it's coming back to me. By the way, I have to say that the um, the last public thing I've ever done, like meaning go out in public, is I went, uh, I saw those guys in Milwaukee you know, on March 11th. It was their last concert. Uh, basically, probably for the year, uh, they didn't, you know, they didn't know it at the time. But yeah. uh, that that was like the last time I've ever been out in public and and and, and with other people. Oh, those guys are amazing. We um, we did a live broadcast of a whole set of music from our Creative Life Studios in Seattle on the day that their big album dropped. Whatever, I think that was 2011 or 12. So I've known those guys for a long time, and yeah. I know you think highly of them and. And I want to explore a little bit of the stuff that it seems like you do um, for 
I don't know if it's for fun. Maybe you can tell us why you do it. You photographed all the Lumineers a lot. Um, Brandy Carlisle is obviously a subject of yours. Your turtle Charlotte is a subject, and and yeah, she's walking around. <laughs> someone uh, in in the broadcast or someone in the comments said, "I think I see a turtle head over there somewhere in the yeah, behind she, your shoulder." She was walking around. I don't know where she is right now, but she <laughs> was walking around. Um, well, as those. Um, those subjects are very different than what you're known for photographing. I'm just wondering if you can talk about, is that an area of passion? Are these just friends of yours you're casually photographing? Um, and since we we share that in common, I was just a little bit curious how, how you go back with uh, Jeremiah and Wesley and those guys. Yeah, no, I met them uh, for the first time at um, at South by South Lawn uh, when, when you were there. And... Um, kept in touch with them. And then uh, my book, Obama, an intimate portrait was, was printed in Verona, Italy. Uh, and I was in, uh, I was there for three weeks as they were printing the book. Um, and it just so happened that the Lumineers had a, <laughs> came con through. <laughs> had a concert in Verona. And so I, I hooked up with them there and, uh, and then I sort of kept in touch and um, they invited me to Photograph in the studio when when before their uh, their third album came out, and um, yeah, so you know I've become friends with them and um, I like music. I've 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 been a huge music fan my whole life. I'm a, I, I've played guitar my whole life. I'm really bad at it, but I you know I play chords and stuff like that. And I met Brandy. I don't know ten ten or so years ago. She became a really big good friend of mine, and uh, um, so I, you know, I photographed her a lot. Um, and I, you know, I think it's, I think it, it, it's funny. Like I was mentioning earlier, that I just happened to be in journalism school when I developed a passion for photography. And I think if if I had if I had thought about it back then and known that you could become a music photographer that I sort of like to go back to 1976 and, and switch, <laughs> and, you know, start to make my mark as a music photographer back then. So now I kind of just do it for fun uh, is, is probably more than anything. Um, it's, it's really seeing your pictures. Um, you can tell the connection that you have with the artists is, uh, key to it. I'm, I'm sort of hearkening the commentary that you had earlier around just being able to be present with um, a, an Obama or a Reagan or it, just, you know, be the fly on the wall, be comfortable to be around. And I think that's um, probably has a, a little bit to do with the photographs that you're able to get of some of these musicians. It's fun to see you outside of what you're well known for and obviously still um, making incredible pictures. Um, what about Charlotte? Like uh, you've taken documenting her. I've seen a lot of Charlotte videos on your IG feed. Um, always been a turtle guy. Yeah, I mean she she has her own uh, Instagram feed. Now. Yeah, Charlotte. Let's, the well, let's, I think she yeah. has like twenty five thousand followers. Or like that. <laughs> Charlotte the tortoise. Uh, Charlotte curious. the tortoise. So she, um, you know, sh uh, uh, my wife's kids got Charlotte when they were little kids, and kids kids grow up, they leave the house. And they don't take their pets with them. <laughs> so now I sort of like am, I guess, the father to, to Charlotte and um, her her caretaker. And she's just like, you know, it's just an unusual pet. And um, I started, you know, doing videos of her and still photos. And um, people were just fascinated. So she started her own account. And um <laughs> There's actually, she posted, Charlotte posted today a selfie of, with me and, and Charlotte. Uh, and that's all I'll say, so people can go check it out. It's not on my Instagram account, it's on her Instagram account. Charlotte the tortoise, for those who are curious and tuning in late. Uh, and if you are tuning late, I'm Chase Jarvis. I'm here with Pete Souza, legendary photographer of many things, and not the least of uh, the chief photographer for Barack Obama um, at the White House. Uh, I, let's see here. So we've uh, covered a lot of ground. I think it's really important to cover uh, a piece of locking, making choices 
with your art and locking these. You've got 1.9 million moments that you've captured in film, but you know only a couple hundred get to make your books. And um, a couple of books, one most recently, Shade, Tale of Two Presidents, before that, Obama, An Intimate Portrait, um, both number one New York Times bestsellers. Um, when we think about creating and putting as much stuff out as we can and capturing the moments and getting them cataloged, at some point we have to make a choice of what art to put out there and what to hold on to. Um, talk to us about editing those books. And when you have 1.9 million images and you have some of the most iconic photographs of, um, uh, of an icon iconic time and iconic, uh, I guess, subjects like Reagan, like Obama and all of the world's top dignitaries and whatnot, how in the world do you make choices? That was tough. I mean, the Obama and intimate portrait, which, which is, you know, the book that I'll forever be the proudest of that I've ever done. Um, there's probably a little over 300 pictures in the book and it was agonizing. I, I don't know how else to say it, but, I, but I, but I had a few things in the back of my mind. One was, what was it like during the Obama presidency? And that, so that was a thought in the back of my mind. Uh, two, what, what are some of the, the, the most important things that happened um, big events. And, and three, what's Barack Obama like as a human being? And that probably overrode everything is, is I really wanted to show, uh, images that showed, um, what he was like as a, as a, as a person. And, um, there's, there's some big events that just didn't, didn't make, didn't make the book. Um, because I was more looking for these human moments, these human interactions that I thought um, really showed what what he was like. And you know, there's a, there's some cool pictures in there too. You know, like of Air Force One and Marine One, and um, you know, just like cool vi visual images that maybe don't tell you anything about him. Um, and trying to mix some of those in too. But for the most part, you know, the, the, the ones that I was really trying to get in the most were just those, those moments that, that tell you what he's like. Moments with others, moments alone. Um, yeah, all of that. All of it. <laughs> of course, um, lots of folks want to know about your favorite capture. And I personally hate, hate being asked about my favorites, but I've, I'm projecting now, and that's a bad role as an interviewer. So, do you have some favorites, can, or or is yeah, the one? I mean, I mean, for me, it was the the the, uh, the the the, and I don't think I really mentioned this before, but I was uh, um, intent on trying to create the best body of work uh, that had ever been done on a president. That was sort of like, you know, that that was my overarching goal. And so I'll let, you know, others sort of weigh in on, well, this is your best picture. This is your most fit. You know, I mean, a lot of people say, oh, the Situation Room is your most famous picture. Well, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it is. It's a historic image. But at the same time, I would say that's like it's not hanging on my wall anywhere. You know, it's it's not one of those. Um, so. And, and I think over time it changes, you know, what, what are your favorite images? It, it, it changes over time. And um, so I sort of like always punt in answering that. <laughs> Me too. I, anything that's a superlative, like what's the best, the most, the coolest, it's just it's always so hard. You're picking from a lifetime of things. And I can only imagine that's probably exponentially harder for someone who's lived the life and seen the things that you've seen. Um, speaking to your uh, hanging on your wall back there, I do see the famous Snake River Grand Teton uh, image by Ansel Adams um, in the background there. Is, well, I'll tell you a funny you... story about that. Please is, do. <laughs> when I was, when my book Shade came out, it was being printed at uh, Meridian, Meridian Printing in Rhode Island. They do great photography books. And while my book was printing on one press, this poster was being printed on the other press. 
And I saw it coming off the press, and I was like, can I have one of those? <laughs> and they're like, yeah, we'll trim off, you know, all the color codes. And I said, no, 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 keep all that stuff on there. I want everything. I want the, like, the, uh, the whole sheet. And so that's what that is. I don't know if you can see at the top is the... Yeah, is the color, the, yeah the color bars. Yeah. To me, that was the coolest part of it, so... In parallel with that, are there other photographers whose work um, that you respect and admire or that have maybe played a key role in developing you as an artist? Um, it's a little bit of a typical question, but I'm wondering if you have, um, you know, if you have some folks that you looked up to that have paved the way or, or maybe even outside of photography that have um, been really influential in your development as a creator. I mean, there's so many. Um, I mean, I think for for uh, for me, um, I mean, two people, three people that I never met that have influenced my career: uh, Cartier Bresson, of course, the great French uh, photographer, who was so good at uh, composition, framing, and 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 moments. The decisive life, moments. Slice yeah. of life. Slice of life. Uh, w. Eugene Smith, the the old uh, uh, Life magazine photographer, photojournalist, uh, you know, developer of the picture story, the photo essay, in and, and, and many ways. And um, you know, looking through his his famous essays, the Country Doctor, and um, things like that, certainly had, had influenced me. And then I think in in terms of um, at the White House, uh, Yoshi Okamoto, who was LBJ's photographer and really was the first official White House photographer to truly document a presidency for history, meaning he just had total access and just raised the bar on what it meant to be a White House photographer. And in, in terms of White House photography, I think that he he definitely influenced me more than anyone. And I'm Sorry that I never got to to to, to meet him. He tragically um, died um, from suicide, I think, in 1984. And last matter of fact, that last year, last fall, I got this call, sort of out of the blue, from his son. Uh, and it was, a, it was such a fascinating conversation to talk to his son about his dad. Um, so I think. You know, Okamoto has had a huge influence on my uh, White House career. Well, you are insanely talented at your job. You've got a, a clear place in history locked in for yourself, and the images that you have created locked in that um, the legacy of a couple men in particular, of Barack Obama, of course. Um, but with respect to your own, um, I'm, I'm curious if you have advice and uh, advice for people who it's not just about wanting to become the next presidential photographer, but for people who have big dreams. And I don't know when you came into have the dream of being, uh, you know, a, a white house photographer or one for, uh, particular for Obama, but clearly you've had dreams in your career. And I'm wondering if you could give some advice, not just for photographers, but for all creators out there about what it took to pursue your dreams and if there's something that's missing from the dialogue in pop culture at large. Well, that's a, that's a big question. <laughs> and to, I, I will, I'll simplify it uh, because um, I can only um, say what's, what's worked for me, which is, um, you know, work hard, um, every assignment, every, uh, time you're asked to make a picture, uh, no matter who the client is, do the best, you know, the best job you, you, you can. Um, the, you, you're going to get, uh, lucky in your career. Um, if people see that you do, uh, work hard for photographers and, uh, specifically, 
And I don't think there's any, like, you can't get on an elevator and hit 20 and get the job that you want. You know, you just, you just have to work hard. And, and I, I would not necessarily aspire to become a White House photographer. And, and I say that because the odds are against you. <laughs> and I mean, I got lucky. That's, that's how it happened to me. And you could do all the right things and still not get that job. So instead, I would say just, you know, do the best you can at what you're doing. People will recognize it. Um, for, for a photographer, I think it's so important to uh, get out there every single day to make pictures. Um, I think you learn by your failures. And the only way that you can fail is to try. Um, and, you know, even today, I mean, I'm limited in um, because of my, I have asthma, you know, I'm at that age group where I do not want to get coronavirus. So I'm li limited in what I can do. But I'm still, I mean, I was out this morning um, doing macro shots of my peonies out front, you know, just just try to engage every day in photography. Um, I mean, you, you look at somebody like John Stanmeyer, who is, I think on day, I don't know, 40 something. Uh, he's a National Geographic photographer stuck at home in Massachusetts. And every day he's photographing in his house. And it's fascinating. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's genius uh, to show the creativity that exists in the world. Uh, and if you, you're not, uh, th th these are different times and some people are, are willing to take more risks uh, than, than me and that's all fine and everything. But uh, I think it's so important to be photographing every day and learn from your mistakes. You said a, a, a one-liner, it was a, quick one-liner earlier in our conversation that I want to come back to here at the end. And the, the quick one-liner was, I just tried to make the most authentic images that I could. And you were referring to um, the, the Obama presidency. Clearly, you're a super authentic person. This conversation just oozes it. And I'm wondering, when you said make an authentic portrait and when you carry yourself as you do, like what is what is authenticity for you, it's a word that gets thrown around quite a bit, but you know, what was, you know, how do you think of that word and what role has it played in your, your career? I mean, I think it's, I think it's, um, to me, authenticity is, um, uh, you know, being truthful, uh, and, and, and truth is open to interpretation uh, and because we all bring our own, you know, background and, 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 and thinking into every situation we're in, but, you know, authenticity to me means, um, that you're representing what is taking place in a, in a, in a objective and, and truthful way. And, and, and to me, it's the, the, the mood and the emotion, right. That, that you're like the picture in the situation room to me that represents the true mood and emotion of what was taking place that, that I witnessed the, the way I saw it. And so I think that's what I mean by authenticity. Um, and I think it's, it's actually even more important today uh, than ever that photojournalists especially are doing that. Because, I mean, I don't want to get into politics, but, but you, you know, the, 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 that we have one of our highest national leaders uh, questioning the, uh, whether something is fake news or not. It is so important for photojournalists, especially, to be authentic in the, in the images that they're posting or publishing. Um, and, and not to, um, not to misrepresent 
any situation, um, it, it, it is so vitally important. Uh, on the topic of importance, shade Taylor two presidents, incredible, um, not just result in having, you know, so many copies be sold and hit the New York times list, but just incredibly timely Obama, an intimate portrait, such a, uh, a capsule of legendary work. Um, those two books, if you haven't, uh, if you're listening right now and you haven't looked at either or both, um, now is a great time to go pick up a copy. And uh, I'm curious, Pete, what, you know, after after two just incredible, um, incredible books, what is next? Do you have another book in the works? Are you working on something that you can share with us right now? Or is it all hush hush? <laughs> what are you um, working on? I'm I I've I mean I've got um I, I'm I'm still actually trying to figure out my next big project. Um will I do another book someday? Yes. What what will that book be? Not sure yet. Um I will I will tell your listeners listeners that uh there is a documentary film in the works coming out about uh, me and my career, mostly centered on President Obama, that will be out this fall. Uh, it's it's being produced and uh, by uh, Laura Dern, the actress, and um, Evan Hayes, who uh, produced uh, Free Solo. Um, and so that's coming out this fall, and and I have uh, a lot of involvement in 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 uh, in, in that film. I'm also helping uh, President Obama with the um, photographs for his forthcoming book. And um, so some of the, hopefully some of the pictures that didn't, didn't make my book will, will, will appear in his book. So I'm sort of helping him curate uh, th those images. Nice. Just Kick, kicking it with a casual uh, shared Lightroom library <laughs> or walk down the street and lay out some tear sheets and help the uh, former president pick out some good pictures. I'm sure it's more uh, more advanced than that, but I would love to see some more of those images come to light, as I'm sure so many. And congratulations on the documentary. Wow. That is... Yeah, yeah it's, a little, what... it's a little unnerving because... Um, the you know I'll I'll lose a little bit more of my anonymity, um, which you know which is a, a little uncomfortable, but um, you know I I think it's I think it's for the the I think the documentary will be for the greater good. So um, what uh, a, what a crew you've got working on it. Um, I've been a long time friends with Jimmy Chin, the director for Free Soul, who was actually the, the most recent guest last week on the show, right? Uh, right oh, preceded, okay. preceded yeah, you. I've never met Jimmy, and obviously he's he's good friends with Evan Hayes, who yeah. is one of the producers, and yeah. now I'm good friends with Evan. So it's small some, world. Someday we'll meet. Someday. <laughs> I think so. We'll all we'll all come together and just I, I can't thank you enough for not just this conversation but your role in history for being such an iconic humble hardworking, uh you know badass photographer uh, clearly uh one of the best in the business best to ever hold a camera in the photojournalism world you've taken you know some of the most iconic photographs of the last 20 years um and i'm just it's really important that i give you a shout out from michael and chris and ali rice and robert and Han and Ryan and Jennifer Lee, people from all over the world want to say thank you so much for inspiring them. There's a lot of congratulations about your book, a lot of just kind notes about your role in telling amazing stories of the past two decades. And just for me personally, thanks so much for being on the show. Pete, what's the best place if people want to learn more, where would you steer them? Um, and how can this community come together to, to help support you as, a, as the artist you are? Uh, yeah, so my website's PeteSouza.com, pretty simple. And at Instagram, I'm at Pete Souza. So it's, uh, those, <laughs> those are, I actually haven't updated my website in probably, I don't know, five years or something like that. Um, but, you know, you could see more of my, more of my work there. And I regularly post to, to Instagram if you're not following me on Instagram. Um, and, you know, sometimes I post, 
old pictures of President Obama or new pictures of Charlotte or, you know, pictures of my flowers. <laughs> it's all it's all fascinating. And while uh, Charlotte might be a great subject, she's not the fastest typer. So she does not post as often as no, Pete. She doesn't but... post as often, but um, yeah, she posts a lot of videos. <laughs> Um, and that's Charlotte the Tortoise for anyone who's curious on Instagram. Uh, Pete, again, thanks so much for being on the show. Uh, you're a legend and an inspiration to so many, including myself. I appreciate you taking the time out, and uh, I just want to wish you the very best. Thanks for having me on, Chase. I appreciate All it. All right, everybody, signing off. Uh, make sure to go follow Pete if you're not already. I know most of you probably are, as, as he's a legend in our midst. And remember... If uh, you were watching this at, at Facebook Live or YouTube Live, come check us out at creativelive.com slash TV, where we have conversations like this every day and more than 2,000 classes from the world's top creators and entrepreneurs. I'm Chase Jarvis signing off. Pete, thanks again for being on the show. We'll see everybody again, hopefully, tomorrow.